Welcome back to the Edison Awards Meet the Innovators Earth Day 2021 edition. We're glad you're here. And on this Earth Day, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what's happening off the Earth. Our first panel is on the future of space exploration and the space economy. You know, we're in an era now where access to space is becoming more affordable uh, and uh, more easy and safer than ever. And of course, no matter what happens in space, Florida is the perfect place to uh, begin that journey, as we've known for many years. Uh, I want you to uh, participate in this throughout the whole day. Uh, we'll have an opportunity. You'll see there's a microphone in the uh, aisle in the middle there. Toward the end of our discussion, we'll do about 45 minutes with these guys. Uh, toward the end, we'd love to hear your uh, questions and comments. And for those of you online, uh, part of the streaming uh, audience for this, you can go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and do hashtag MTI, hashtag MTI, and uh, submit us your questions, and we'll incorporate that into our conversation. So space. Space is, uh, you know, I've uh, loved space uh, for a very long time. And for many years, we've talked about uh, an era where we can get to space uh, in an easier way. And what's happened are two very exciting things. First of all, the cost of launching things into space, driven by the commercial sector, is going down. And the payloads themselves uh, are becoming smaller in many respects. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, on our panel, we have a, it's quite an all-star panel. Kevin DiMarzio with Redwire. Redwire is a company that's involved in building space infrastructure. Dale Ketchum, who is uh, with Space Florida, vice president there. Kevin Simmons, who is an uh, educator at a school called the White School on the East Coast, but also is heavily involved in the CubeSat revolution. And one of his uh, former students, Samer Alhushi, who is a ninth grader at the American Heritage School and who's holding a payload. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But you know, I want to talk with you, uh, Dale, first. Florida and space. Um, some of this is geography. You have that advantage. But uh, Florida has done a great job over the years of nurturing a commercial enterprise here as well. Yeah, we are, uh, we are Space Florida is basically the, a, spa, a state entity. We are at like an airport authority or a seaport authority, but we're a spaceport authority with jurisdiction throughout the state. And our job is to grow and foster the growth of the commercial aerospace industry and specifically the commercial space industry. And I think anybody who's alive now is quite familiar with uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and the amazing accomplishments that are being achieved in space every day. And I think one of the things that I think is important that I'd like to convey today is why is space important, particularly to this audience, because Space is, a, it, we're really opening up. Uh, it's traditionally been NASA uh, exploration missions and or national security missions by the Department of Defense. Both are essential, both are gonna continue. Um, but what we're really seeing now and what Space Florida is primarily focused on is the growth of the commercial space in industry, which is where people are going out into space for tourism, for um, manufacturing for censoring all these things that are great at developing a human enterprise basically business people are going to start making serious money in space they already are to a large extent I think what what we are focused on is how can Florida capture the value add that's going to come about as we bring human enterprise into space and I'm let me let me offer a couple of examples of that um, one, Redwire, we'll talk about one of them that's, that's really cool uh, relative to manufacturing. But uh, things such as, uh, based upon the opening, I, I want to touch on a couple of, of ideas that came to mind. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking, who passed uh, quite a few years ago, uh, Space Florida had sponsored for him uh, his zero gravity flight. I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with Dr. Hawking, chances are you have seen the, um, the pictures of him in floating in that zero gravity flight where he I was there that day, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. and right. it's a great, it, you can just see the smile on his face because a man as burdened as he was in that wheelchair for so long with such a brilliant mind to see him freed and floating and the smile on his face was just incredible. 
And when you take people who otherwise would be wheelchair bound on Earth into a microgravity or zero gravity environment, you're liberating them in many ways. You're freeing them to put more of their efforts into what their creativity exists in. So, you know, that's going to be a part of space exploration that we don't know what that's going to lead to. We use the analogy of the internet, the creation of the internet. When it first was created, we didn't really know what that meant, what it would lead to, but now we do. Human enterprise, human ingenuity, innovation brought to a capability like that. And space is going to be in large measure just like that. We don't know what it's going to lead to, but it is going to create an enormous opportunity for human enterprise, and I hope we spend the panel discussing that. Well, that, uh, that leads to uh, Kevin DeMarzio very well. So when you talk about building an infrastructure in space, what do you mean? Uh, what, what needs to be out there in order to facilitate uh, what Dale was just talking about? Yeah, so one of the core foundations of red wire space is developing and building economical and sustainable infrastructure. And when I got here, I was able to look around and see a lot of that coming to fruition right now. And one of the main things that everyone really sees in the space industry today is folks like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos enabling the access to space. But really, what do you do once you get there? And Redwire is really focused on what we're able to do and to develop the way that humans can live and work up in space. So development of that infrastructure really going to lead to amazing things and really right now on the precipice of that even though we've had the International Space Station in orbit for a couple decades now with constant human habitation we're really just starting to see us being able to lift and launch a lot more astronauts and those being coming really a lot more famous so for Redwire we're developing different ways to manufacture products uh, using the microgravity environment so that unique way where we're able to take folks like Stephen Hawking up there and, and liberate them like that, we can actually use that to develop and innovate new ways of manufacturing goods and products for benefit down here on Earth. And that's one of the core fundamentals of what we've been developing here and using the International Space Station as a test bed. So we've been developing technologies like additive manufacturing. We've been developing technologies that allow for satellites to be designed in completely new ways. We're developing autonomous robotics and simulation and modeling technology that really transfers and translates down here to different goods and services that you'd see in your day-to-day -day life. So plenty, plenty of innovations that so, we're doing. All right, well, Kevin, help us understand, though, it, it, when you start thinking about manufacturing things in space, you know, we're not talking about sneakers, right? But what, what are the products that would be worth uh, doing it that way such that people would pay that premium? Yes, so one of the main things with microgravity is when you're up there, you don't have to actually be bound by that variable of actually manufacturing goods. So one thing that we actually just flew to the space station just recently in October was manufacturing ceramics. So ceramics are actually this very brittle technology or, as when you think of it like pottery and cups, but they're very resistant to heat, so you can touch it even when you have hot coffee inside that cup. Well, when we actually develop uh, power generation, so things like gas turbines where they spin very fast and go to thousands of degrees, ceramics is actually a very great way of increasing the efficiency of that dramatically. And what that does is it brings down the cost of power and increases the output overall. So we're manufacturing different parts on the International Space Station like ceramics. And one, one thing that Space Florida helped to fund was we were manufacturing fiber optic cables. The internet has been able to progress around the world by being connected through fiber optics. So when you have to talk to someone over in Europe or over in Asia, we're able to actually use the fiber optic connections that run through the different oceans. And developing better, more efficient ways of manufacturing those glass products will lead to better day-to-day -day life here, even though you don't necessarily get to see it or touch it. So microgravity has actually enabled us to have a, a more uniform crystalline structure. Very fancy way of saying, the light goes through it a lot easier and a lot more effective. So we can have speeds that are just orders of magnitude greater than what we're able to have today, instantaneous communication. So fiber optics, ceramics, electronics, super alloys, there's so many different ways that we can use microgravity to manufacture right. goods. So we're going to have factories in space. I, I look forward to that day. That'll be interesting. Kevin Simmons, uh, let's talk about the other side of this. The cost of getting things into space is going down thanks to Elon Musk and others. 
Uh, but the payloads are also getting smaller in many respects. I mean, the human payloads aren't getting any smaller, that's for sure. But uh, the, uh, when you're talking about unpiloted missions, we're talking now about a revolution, what are called CubeSats. And you've gotten involved with this as a tool to educate young people like Samer. Uh, but why don't you just, to the uninitiated, explain what CubeSats are and what uh, appealed to you about them and it got you so interested in them. Thank you. Uh, there were two professors, one at Cal Poly and one at Stanford, uh, around 2000, that were working together. And this Professor Twiggs at Stanford uh, as the story goes, literally held up a Beanie Baby box of his daughter and said, I wonder what graduate students could do if we constrained their satellite to this size. So he, along with uh, Jordy, uh, Professor Jordy at Cal Polytech, they not only came up with this form factor, the CubeSat, but also the deploying mechanism, which would protect the rocket and the, whatever the principal payload was. So these became secondary payloads. They were catching free rides on rockets that had additional uh, space and capacity. Now the CubeSat's original function was meant uh, for graduate students to be able to design, test, build, and fly their satellite in the four years or so they were in grad school. Because if you think about it, a large, let's say, communication satellite, that, that's a decadal mission, right? From the time it's conceived until the end of its life might be 30 years. So that's not a, an easy time frame to work with with education. But the CubeSat allowed uh, tremendous flexibility. And as uh, Professor Twiggs told me once, he said, if you give uh, engineers a really large vehicle, they'll try to put too many things on it. And so it was a way to de-scope and to simplify to really make it about education. And as you'll learn later, the CubeSat, not CubeSat launch initiative that uh, NASA, uh, a wonderful NASA program, their primary customers or applicants are universities, and, and of which we've, we've been one. Kevin, that's fascinating. I just a quick note to our streaming audience. We are aware of the choppy video, and we are working on it. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to put Samer on it right after this. Get you over there and try to get this web stream going. I have a feeling you can do it. Samra, tell us a little bit about your projects and what got you enthused about space and CubeSats. Thank you. Yeah, so when I first uh, was recruited by my teacher, Mr. Simmons, for the Wolfpack CubeSat Development Team program in 2018, I was definitely a little intimidated. Again, it was my sixth grade year. But from then on, we started learning a lot more about aerospace engineering, how to build, construct these CUBE satellites and actually end up launching them. And like what Mr. Simmons was saying with the CubeSat launch initiative, we actually ended up launching a CubeSat called the YSAT-1 in, with the CubeSat launch initiative program in 2018. So later on, after I got more used to the program and gained a lot more passion for it after I was there for a little while, we went to this conference called the International SmallSat Conference in 2018 where you can look at different forerunners in the satellite industry, including component vendors and different presentations. And it was there where there was this large exhibit hall that I was able to go to, where there were different vendors from different companies, in, in, in like forerunners in academia, government, private industries, and even with affiliation with NASA. And I was able to find what the electrical power system was, or EPS was, for a CubeSat. I found the difference between different types of batteries. And the most commonly used battery in a CubeSat today is called the lithium ion battery. I also found a different one called a capacitor. So I was able to compare those two on that trip, and it was an assignment from Mr. Simmons, actually, to start trying to learn and think about more CubeSat ideas that we could potentially submit to NASA. So what I was thinking was there's this capacitor and a lithium-ion battery, which is the most commonly used battery in CubeSats. A capacitor is much smaller, even though they have similar purposes of storing energy and transferring energy for powering a CubeSat or whatever you'd like to power. Capacitors are much smaller and could potentially be a little less dangerous for the CubeSat if a lithium ion battery overcharges, potentially heats up and causes the CubeSat to erode. I found maybe capacitors could be safer, uh, more cost effective if you have them in large bunches in that CubeSat. So later on that year, I was able to lead a proposal having to do with trying to validate a capacitor as a primary power source in a CubeSat because we've never really seen that done before. And later on, we, I found out that after that, the CapSat 1, the, the mission that I submitted, was selected to the CubeSat launch initiative program by NASA in March. And since then, we've just been rolling, trying to 
to get our reviews done for the CAPSAT 1 mission and doing a lot of research to make sure that it's optimal for its launch. And this summer, we're going to be going through a lot of reviews and tests and designs for the first prototype of the CAPSAT 1, eventually do a vibration testing for the mission in around August to September, get it ready for launch at around October, September, and then it'll hopefully launch by December with NASA's CubeSat Launch Initiative program. All right, Samer, jeez. I'm, I'm sufficiently impressed. And uh, ninth grade, huh? Not bad. All right, so um, it just... He, he actually had the idea in the seventh grade. <laughs> Just, just for the record, so, and, and Kevin, I think you might need to share the microphone with Sam on this one. If you could, uh, this is not a model of your uh, spacecraft. That's the actual size. People need to understand what CubeSats are really all about. It's, these are tiny one. payloads, and you can put a lot of them in space, which provide all kinds of capability for experiments and sensing and so forth. Explain what's in your hand. Yeah, so this is a form factor for a regular CubeSat called a 1U, and you can stack these into different U's or units. There's a 2U, which would be this basically multiplied by 2 vertically, and this will be the size of the CapSat 1 mission. It is a 1U CubeSat, and you can fit, like what Mr. Sims was saying, anything here to uh, successfully launch your CubeSat mission. And in here, there's a little thing called an emulator that's used mainly as like what's called a bus to power and make sure that everything is running inside of the CubeSat. It's essentially like the the programming to make sure that your CubeSat is running when it's in space. And this is around the average size of what you, most universities, or as in our case, like middle and high school students would be using to build and develop a CubeSat. So, uh, well, c congratulations on that. So, Dale, this is all about, as much as anything, democratizing space, whether it's uh, easier access for people or for kids to put in um, CubeSats to, to learn about space and engineering and science or for that matter, for individuals to get their own sensing data for weather. Uh, it truly, it, it feels like a revolution. We've been talking about it for decades. It's finally happening now, isn't it? What's exciting about it is you are seeing the success of, of Elon Musk, which is just amazing. And no one has any doubt that Jeff Bezos is going to be able to really come to the table and bring a whole new set of capabilities to get that access into space. And if you look at, at, at what Bezos articulates, his idea is uh, millions of people living and working in space. And he is building the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure to get to space as sort of his contribution because he recognizes he became the wealthiest man in the world through Amazon because other people had developed key infrastructure, the internet, overnight delivery services, electronic payment, all these infrastructure systems had to be in place in order for him to take the next step and develop Amazon. And he recognized this, and he's always said, Amazon is just his piggy bank to pay for Blue Origin to put in place this transportation system. But uh, there are a whole lot of other people. As payloads are getting smaller, so too are a lot of the launch vehicles. You're having a lot of small launch vehicles that are going to be much more responsive and being able to launch from a variety of different locations, although they should still launch from the Cape. They need to be able to launch quickly and responsively anywhere in the world to get small payloads up to meet national disasters, emergencies, or for national security purposes. If somebody who doesn't like us takes some of our satellites out, we can immediately replace them. But the, the key here is just, again, as, as has been stated, it's not so much the transportation, it's what we do in space that is the ultimate driver. And allow me to offer another example that I think will help fire up the imagination of the people who are participating in this, is uh, one of the things that we've come to understand very clearly is that bacteria and viruses become much more virulent in space. We're not entirely sure why, but they just become meaner. And that in and of itself is important because that enables us to understand better as we study up there on the station and elsewhere, what happens to make them become meaner. And that, that helping to understand that it will help us back down here on Earth. And you know, helping to understand how viruses become transition from one species to another obviously is a lot more important to all of us on this planet than it was a year and a half ago. But we've also found with my, my colleagues at the University of Florida have been studying the biodomes, the, the bacteria uh, enterprises that go on around all life forms. 
and they found that bacteria that were healthy on, and I'm, I forget exactly what the species was, but let's say it was, a, was grew on a, on a flower, would all of a sudden start attacking a cucumber. O only, it doesn't happen down here, but it starts happening up there. And our ability to better understand how a bacteria or a virus jumps from benign on one species to hostile on another, that is going to pay huge dividends down here. And it's very important in space, because if you think a pandemic is a problem on Earth, imagine you're on a big space station or a Mars colony and there's a pandemic. That's, that's a bad thing. But helping us, being in space is providing a whole new range of opportunity to understand the laws of physics haven't changed, but they're different up there. And our ability to better understand that will lead to a whole host of new opportunities. I uh, want to remind our audience here as well as on the stream to participate with us if you like. Slido.com is the location for comments and questions. Slido.com, hashtag MTI. We look forward to your uh, comments and your questions. Kevin DiMarzio, you know, it's Earth Day. Uh, we can talk a lot about uh, moving forward into space and colonizing space, but uh, I do know that the new NASA budget has a lot of extra money in it to focus on my favorite planet, which is Earth. And uh, to what extent can we uh, at least begin to uh, quantify, recognize, and begin to tackle the climate emergency by using space as a tool? Yeah, so this is a fantastic question. And if you can recall some of what Dale just said, a lot of what we do up in space brings value back down here to Earth. So this infrastructure that we're developing can solve some of these key problems or at least help to mitigate a lot of what is happening in our world today. So infrastructure can really help support things like power generation. So one of the main things that my company is doing with all of these types of manufacturing is developing key ways to develop structures that are much, much larger up there than what we'd be able to do down here. So from a single device the size of something the size of this TV, I can manufacture a metal structure a kilometer long. And what I can do with that kilometer is put a lot of different solar panels on it to allow for power generation to occur up in space. And this is something that I think is actually starting to come to the forefront of the space industry, which is how can we use that environment to help solve key problems down here on Earth? So the manufacturing technology that Redwire is developing today can be used to, to help solve some of these things like climate change. And one of the other things with these very large structures, not only just developing power generation, but also allowing us to use different types of sensors for imaging different things that happen down here on Earth. So one amazing thing that we've been able to do with satellites is to actually image the Earth and understand what is happening on a macro scale rather than focusing on one specific area. And these macro effects and environmental changes that we're seeing from things like large hurricanes or typhoons we can start to navigate and figure out what are the best ways that we can either mitigate or solve and help our world today. So Redwire enabling these key pieces of infrastructure to be manufactured up there, we can then start to say what types of power can we generate like solar and bring it back down here to Earth? What types of imaging can we actually use up in space? And how can we have humans live and work up there to actually solve these problems and bring that value back down here? Kevin Simmons, uh, let's talk about how CubeSats fit into all this, because uh, I'm familiar with a, a company uh, based in Orlando, uh, MyRadar.com. It's a, a weather app. And uh, they are now in a position where they can afford to launch their own CubeSats to get their own weather data. They don't have to go through NOAA or other sources, other government sources. The democratization of that kind of data uh, is has tremendous uh, potency to it. It's not just as a tool to educate young people, but for all of us to benefit from. Give us a sense of some of the CubeSats ideas that are out there right now that are in this realm. Sure. The, there are some major classes or types of payloads, and they all have some, some really outstanding examples. Um, the ones that I'm most familiar with, as, as you're aware, communications. Um, communications are the primary payloads on most satellites. Uh, there are, um, with the small satellites especially, you can validate new technologies in a much lower cost way that uh, rather than try something out new on a $250 million satellite, 
why not evaluate it on a $100,000 satellite? So there's a, there's a way to advance technologies down the, the technology readiness level. Uh, life sciences, as uh, Dale mentioned, uh, our first payload was actually uh, a bacterial payload where some students had read a paper that perhaps dirty comets were seeding life on other planets. So that was an astrobiology payload. So by building uh, our satellite to actually fly some ex exotic extremophiles that were found in an ice core uh, that were still uh, viable, we were able to consider that. So we were able to model something that you know, might be happening on comets. I think there's a lot of potential for pharmaceuticals. I, I really think that, uh, as Dale mentioned, not only the biology but uh, drug development, I think there's a lot of potential there. I, I see the CubeSats as the most disruptive tool for keeping students in, luring them into the STEM pipeline, and keeping them there so they don't leak out. And that's not my language. I, I learned that at the National Science Foundation a few years ago, but we don't get enough students and we don't get enough diverse students into the STEM pipeline, and then it's too easy for them to leak out. There's a lot of uh, sort of instant gratification out there in education as well as other walks of life, but if you put a kid on a pathway where in two years this little thing that you put your hands on is going to be in space, I would like to think that that actually does really change the trajectories of their lives, even if a little bit. Sam, are you not going to leak, are you? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. So we got a couple of questions here uh, from Slido, and we uh, appreciate it. This one from Joyce. This one be for you, Dale. Could it be that the bacteria is normalized to Earth environments when we send them to space? They're stressed and react uh, to continue to exist, and that reaction happens to make them more virulent. I don't know. Is that, uh, that's as good a theory as any, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it, you, you're getting to the right point, though. It's, it's understanding what happens up there it is, is key to bringing value back down to here to Earth, because it's, it's giving us new ways to understand how life works, whether it's bacteria or, or humans. We have our own issues when we stay up there a long duration. Uh, our eyes, our bones, our muscle mass, all of these things change, and our, we're spending a good deal of money trying to understand how, what is exactly happening with life in space. And all of that is leading to a deeper understanding which will directly relate to our ability to address um, the challenges of life, of aging, of, of, of everything. It's paying off down here. That's why we go to space, is because it will help us be better humans here and humans in space. All right, we have about 10 minutes left in this panel, which means if you have a question here in the audience in person, make your way to that microphone and we'll try to recognize you. Question from Frank for Samer. Who are your role models and mentors? And you're allowed to say Kevin, too, if you want. I'm sure he'd be pretty happy if you did that. So yeah, starting off in middle school, I definitely had a lot. Like Mr. Simmons was probably one of the bigger ones because he, he really like taught me a lot, took the time to get me to know a lot more about these CubeSats and Cube satellites. I would also say my parents because, again, in the beginning, I, I did not go to school before the white school with Mr. Simmons that had a lot of this stuff, as most schools don't. But like my parents, when, I found, when, I knew, when they knew that I was like a little confused on the topic, they, they kept me pushing towards it. And they saw that this could be a really big deal for me. And they really tried to get me more passionate towards it. And my parents are definitely big role models for me. So Mr. Simmons, my parents, for getting me more and more passionate towards this, which has obviously been very good for me, and I've enjoyed it a lot. So Samber, where do you see yourself taking your career? I mean, so definitely, I, I want to stay in the field, like Mr. Sims was saying, I don't want to leak out because, again, at this age, it's really important to get more and more people into this field because of how impactful it can be, again, not only for the short term, but the long term. I've also been a little bit passionate for medicine. My parents are both doctors, so I've been flipping between the two fields, but definitely space medicine, as what Dale was saying, is extremely important, and I would probably want to get myself involved with that, biomedical engineering and things like that. So Kevin Simmons, how many SAMRs do you have in your classroom? I would tell you, um, I, we're, we're from Palm Beach County. I would say there are thousands of students in South Florida alone that would build a satellite if someone would show them how. So I think the problem is not the number of students that are capable, are interested, that love space. 
I mean, most of us as kids, it was fireman, astronaut. I mean, there's, that's what you did when you were a kid. And I think that to answer your specific question, Samer is a hardworking, intelligent, motivated student with a lot of discipline for his age. But I, I have had um, dozens of students like that in the six years I, I've worked at this one place. And it's not because um, they were 10 times better than the students around them in the county. It's that they worked as a team. So I, I coached a lot. So building satellites is a team event. All learning, all great disruptive learning is uh, project-based that has an outcome that's a, a real deliverable that the kids can look forward to. Uh, if you think about your sports analogies, when you have the championship ring or the trophy at the end, you have that great, great sense of accomplishment. So these kids, they just look at their satellite on orbit, and I feel like that is inspiring. But to answer your specific question, there is only one SAMR. <laughs> but I was hoping you'd get to that. <laughs> but there, there is only one SAMR. But every year, whichever students out of our large team Whoever comes up with the best ideas, they become the co-investigators on that proposal. So it's then their job to lead any students that want to join them to write the full proposal. They write the draft, then we edit it and get it ready and submit it. So uh, while there is only one SAMR, there, there have been a lot of uh, outstanding kids that I really look forward to seeing them do good things in uh, mostly STEM career fields later. We, we need more SAMRs and more Mr. Simmons, that's for sure. You're doing good work. Let's. Keep that up, will you? We have a question from the audience. Go ahead, say your name, and uh, fire away. Yes, hi, my name is Denise Spence. I uh, run programs at uh, Dunbar High School, school programs, uh, IT programs specifically. How did, what was the process that you did to get involved in this as the teacher so that, you know, so that us who are in the schools can learn from that? Great question. I went to a small sat conference that he mentioned. It's at Utah State. It's the world's biggest gathering for these folks that build this type satellite. So much like life, you find anyone that knows more than you do. You ask all the questions you can and learn everything you can and build your own network. What I, what I shot for was finding a couple of companies that would be willing to work with us that had flight heritage but we're not so large that they would just treat us like a customer because I'm a biochemist. My background is in biochemistry. So the aerospace engineering is something I've had to learn outside of the classroom. And so I found a couple of companies that were willing to give us not only hardware, but teach us about it. And then, um, then I created a lot of summer camps uh, we actually used the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. So I took the 400-page document, sort of congealed it down to about five pages for my middle school students. Sometimes you need uh, commercial off-the-shelf parts. We don't have time to design and build printed circuit boards. Sometimes uh, the nature of the CubeSat is that with the miniaturization of things like smartphone technology, there's a lot of great tech that's already out there. So the question is, can you find parts and can you leverage your robotics teachers and those that work with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis? Can you leverage that expertise? And then I use something in the Army we called the, walk, the crawl, walk, run method. So we built emulators on the bench. Then we put emulators on tethered balloons with uh, little Wi-Fi dongles. And then we used our smartphones to retrieve data teaching the kids about how to access uh, their data remotely. And then, and then we used um, uh, high altitude balloon missions to really hone in because I used a radio on the balloon that was very similar to the radio that we would fly in space. And that radio talks to the Global Star Network and all of our telemetry comes down on a dashboard that any student, if I give them the password, can log into and then download all the data as a spreadsheet. So now you've got uh, all kinds of learning that can happen uh, as they get their hands on the real data. So that's sort of uh, how we did it. That sounds expensive. You know, there are a lot of uh, teachers and school systems where they have to bring in their own school supplies. Is this doable if you're not as well funded as your particular school? So I find that if, you're, if you have limited resources, the tethered balloon and the high altitude balloon, the most expensive thing will be the helium. It turns yeah. out, if you have great, if, if you have an inspired tech teacher, they can scrounge, they can beg, borrow, <laughs> liberate, 
components. <laughs> <laughs> Fell off a truck, huh? <laughs> can, but, but in the end, uh, yes, the helium is the most expensive. And of course, every uh, poor teacher, like I have been in the past, says, maybe we should use hydrogen. But then you, you watch the video of the Hindenburg. Oh, for gosh so, sake. <laughs> We can't get over the Hindenburg 100 years later, for God's sakes. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, let me, I, we have one more here, but let's do one quick slide out question. This is for you, Kevin DiMarzio. What is industry's role in providing more students authentic learning experiences like this? How can you integrate with Mr. Simmons and Samer in, in ways that could be fruitful for both uh, people? Yeah, I love this question because it brings up a really great thing about the things Samer is holding which if you take a really close look at that, you can see that that was most likely 3D printed. And what an amazing accomplishment we've been able to develop is uh, allowing any desktop to actually have an additive manufacturing machine on it. And we actually have one of those at Redwire up on the International Space Station right now, where we've manufactured for uh, a university a CubeSat that we then had astronauts go and assemble up on orbit and then push out the airlock to actually have their experiment in that fashion. And that was a NASA-funded program. So there are ways that you can directly connect with folks in the commercial industry to actually allow for us to partner with students to manufacture things just like he's holding. So we, and, and for me, I actually participate at my alma mater and actually multiple universities and high schools around the country as being an, uh, an advisor and a mentor to different solicitations that come out. And there's even a couple right now that are open where different high schools and universities can participate in as long as they do have the resources to write the proposal, which NASA or different parts of the government, like the Department of Energy, will fund. So we have some resources that we can actually put in to help develop these kinds of efforts and then end up manufacturing over a couple year program just like what you're holding. And then see that come to fruition is really their success just with the advisement of people like me. Total win-win. All right, another question from the audience. Say your name and tell us your question. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Thomas Stutzman, and I'm a principal technology strategist. And uh, first, a commentary. Uh, my whole career is based on watching a television show uh, when I was six years old in black and white, watching some guy step on some planet, uh, some moon out there. And that brought me into technology and STEM. So congratulations, you're on the right track, because this is where it all happens. Now, one of the real questions I have is, what about the reentry? What about all these CubeSats that are out there, and um, how do we try to also maintain cleaning up space over a long period of time? What's your thoughts on that? And you know, any person who wants to comment, I'd be very interested. Um, I'll take a shot at that because I do know that one of the things we're paying attention to is they are starting to do a lot of studies. Um, I should say a lot. They're now starting to give consideration to studying. What is the environmental impact to all this stuff burning up coming back into the, the into the planet? Because all of that, there's a a whole lot of stuff up there. Most of it's debris. Many of a lot of it's been up there for decades and decades. And it, I, I mean hundreds and thousands, literally millions of pieces of debris floating around up there. One thing about space, there's a lot of it. So we're, there's still a lot of room, but it does get problematic, and you've got. I think right now the FAA has requests for licenses approaching 50,000 new satellites over the next 10 years. And even with all the space that's up there, you're going to start running out of it. So the, the challenge is, I'll be honest with you, it is something we are starting to learn how we're going to manage. We're not entirely managing it now. Almost everything that goes up now, you have to have a plan for deorbiting it. Either put it back in, usually everything, the biggest target is the South Pacific. It's a very big target, so you burn up stuff down there. Or you put it up and launch it way, way up so it goes into a completely much safer orbit. Because ultimately, the farther up you go, you're not going to run out of space. All right, we have one, time for one more question. If you could help us by making it sort of brief because we're kind of running out of time. Say your name and give us the question. Sure, I'll just talk really fast. <laughs> That'll work. My name is Nadav Kaufman from Orthoclinical Diagnostics, and I'm curious, with all these developments in the space industry, are you seeing opportunities to expand communications and Internet access to the remote, remote areas of the developing world to help them with economic development? Well, that's, that's exactly what Starlink is with Elon Musk and OneWeb Satellites, which is a, a manufacturing at the Cape. 
um, uh, Amazon as well. Amazon uh, is Kuiper. Uh, there's a we're going to those 50,000 satellites. The vast majority of them are small satellites that are going to be orbiting the Earth, providing exactly what you're talking about: broadband capability to the the middle of the South Pacific Ocean or the jungles of Africa or the outback of Australia and, or rural America. We have a, my colleague in Tallahassee at Space Florida who lives out on a farm has a beta project for Starlink because she can get better service from the satellite than she can from dish TV or cable. All right, we're about out of time. One, th do you want a uh, quick one? I was gonna say, and all of those satellites are actually going to orbit the Earth very close and then come back down very quickly to be replenished over and over. So there won't be that debris management that we just had in the previous question. All right, final quick thought from Samer. You gonna go to Mars? <laughs> I definitely, I would wanna do that, yeah. Okay, all right. I, I think you're gonna be there. Thank you very much. Great panel, appreciate it. Add an asterisk to all of you. Really enjoyed it. We are going to take a uh, five-minute break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about sustainable agriculture in the Everglades. The Edison Awards Meet the Innovators Forum continues. Stay with us.